Well, good morning again, Emmanuel Church. Good morning, Internet family and friends. We pray that and thank you for being with us. We pray that you will be moved and touched by the power and the Word of God. Uh, we need God's touch and His power in our lives each and every day, each and every hour, each and every second. Amen? Uh, before we get into the message, I wanted to share with you that, uh, yeah, according to, uh, to our calculations, we've touched over 41,684 people, but uh, according to our son Nick, he uh, believes that it's probably way more than that, close to 70,000 or more. So we're thankful for that. Uh, Brother Fred's song uh, two weeks ago got 58 views already, so we're thankful for that. Uh, each and every week, uh, people are tuning in to the messages that we, uh, that we bring here at, at Emmanuel Church, and we thank God for that. Um, so, thank you for your faithfulness and for your support of Emmanuel Church. Uh, let's bow in a word of prayer as we uh, begin uh, the journey through God's Word today and what He has for us. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, thanking you and praising you for who you are. Where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. So we know you're here. You're, you're here. We know you're always with us. And we're thankful for that. And so, Lord, we just pray, dear God, that you would open up our hearts and minds that we may receive your word. For without your revelation, without you revealing it to us, we would not know. But we ask, Lord, for the power of your Holy Spirit to flow over us, to Open up our hearts and minds that we may see the more of your magnificence and that we would be encouraged to walk closer and in a deeper uh, passion for you. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Please be with our internet family and friends, Lord. May they uh, feel your mighty presence as well and may they get connected to a, a body of believers, a local church where you can use their gifts and talents and and abilities to further your kingdom and encourage the church body wherever they land at. Thank you, dear God, for loving us and caring for us. And we pray this in the powerful name, the righteous name, the glorious name, the holy name, the, the giving name. Whose name, church? In Again, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you for the hand clap of praise to our God. Well, in review... Uh, when we have faith working with godly works, here's what God's word says happens. Last week we covered uh, Romans 5.1 and this is what it says. It says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, as we are following Abraham's faith, and we are in the book of Romans, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into, here's, here's a very important thing, has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. Amen? And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's what? Glory. His glory. Thank you, Pastor Ray. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. We can rejoice when we have trials and tribulations. Why? For we know that they help us develop endurance. And what? And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Amen? And this hope will not lead to disappointment. Isn't that awesome? No hope that we have in God will lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us. Isn't that awesome? Comforting. Because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. We know all of this through the study of God's Word. And by denying our fleshly ambitions, desires, expectations, and goals, instead we must adopt Yahweh God's already planned out works and paths for us, which we are led by the Holy Spirit. God has already planned out works and paths for us. We don't have to figure out who we are or what we're, what we're to do. God already has a plan. We have to go to Him. 
well, in review of the summary. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Romans 10, 17, faith is believing and trust is acting on that faith with obedient works. Last week's message was faith without works is dead. Well, we want, we want to have faith and we want to have trust. Trust is the acting part of faith where we do God's obedient works, or God's works through being obedient. Without these actions, again, faith is dead. If we're going to experience God working in our lives, we must act on what God is showing us to do through his word, by being in his word. We must also be in church because it is the most important, essential institution on the planet. There's no other institution more important than God's church. And Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Jesus also said, do not forsake the assembling together, which is attending church, so that God can stir up, stir up in our hearts and minds, good works which will exhibit a true born-again faith with his godly works. Amen? So, that's what we covered last week. Faith without works is dead. Let us continue to be faithful to God by surrendering in obedience to doing what he said. So, are you sabotaging your faith unknowingly? We're going to find out that we probably do this more often than we realize. Well, let's start out in Romans 5, 6. It says, while we were still helpless, while we were still powerless to provide for our salvation, at the right time, Christ, as a substitute, he died for the what? Ungodly. For the ungodly. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Now, it is an extraordinary thing for one who is willing to give his life for even an upright man, though perhaps for a good one, one who is noble, selfless, worthy, someone might even dare to die. But God clearly shows and proves his own love towards us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for the ungodly. He died for the sinful man. How can someone care about people who don't care about him or them? How can someone die for someone who doesn't know or want to know that you even exist? This is what Jesus did for us. Jesus gave his life for people who didn't want to believe that God, Jesus, even existed. This is how God demonstrates his love towards us. Amen, church? Amen, internet family and friends? Romans 5, 9 says this, Therefore, since we now have been justified, declared free of the guilt of sin by his what? His blood. Thank you. How much more certain is it that we will be saved, focus on this part, that we will be saved from the wrath of God through him? For if we were enemies, we, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, it is much more certain, having been reconciled, having put our faith in Christ, that we will be saved from the consequence of, the sin, of sin by his life. Amen? That is, we will be saved because Jesus lives today. And I know he lives because he lives in my heart. And he lives in every true believer's heart. It is because we believers are justified. We are justified before God. And we, we will be saved from the wrath of God Almighty, which I really believe applies to being raptured before the tribulation when God pours his wrath upon this earth and he judges sin. Amen? Aren't you glad, if this is true, that God will take us out from his wrath before he pours it on the earth? In Romans 5.11 it says, Not only that, but we also rejoice in God, rejoicing in his love and perfection through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received and enjoy our what? Thank you, Pastor Ray. Our reconciliation. We were enemies of God, but now we've been reconciled. We've admitted our guilt. We've admitted our sin, and we've 
cried out to God and said, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive me and put our faith in Christ who paid for them. Because we have become his believing children, we are no longer his enemies. I don't want to be an enemy of God. If any of you have read the Old Testament, you don't want to be an enemy of God because he is very, very powerful. Wow, so I am so grateful not to be an enemy of God. Internet family and friends, I pray that you are not an enemy of God, that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one what? One man? Yes. And death through sin. So death spread to all people. No one is being able to stop it or escape its power. Sin has power over all of mankind because they all sinned. Sin was committed in the world before, before the law was given, but sin was not charged against anyone when there, is, when there is no law against it. Yet death ruled over mankind from Adam to Moses, who was the lawgiver, even over those who had not sinned, as, as who did? As Adam did. Adam is a type of Christ who was to come, but in reverse, Adam brought destruction. Christ brought salvation. Now, sin has power over all mankind. No one escapes uh, sin. Adam directly disobeyed an order from God. When God told him not to eat of the tree of the good and of good and evil. Now others sinned, but it was not from a direct order from God. However, when the law of Moses was given, then all became sinners. So by one man, Adam, Adam, so by one man, Adam, sin entered mankind's world. And by one man, Jesus Christ, reconciliation came to all who will receive Jesus' gift. Amen? Amen, internet family and friends. Romans 5.15 continues, But the free gift of God is not like the trespass, because the gift of grace overwhelms, totally overwhelms the fall of man. For if many died by one man's what? Thank you, Pastor A. By one man's trespass, which was Adam's sin, much more abundantly did God's grace and the gift that comes by the what? Grace. The grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, to overflow, to benefit the many. In other words, the grace from the Lord Jesus Christ overpowered all of sin to those who will receive it. So nor is the gift of grace like that which came through the one who sinned. For on one hand, the judgment following the sin resulted from one trespass and brought condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift resulted from many trespasses, for many, for all of man has sinned against God. And it brought justification. It brought release from sin's penalty for those who believe. It's simple, it's, but it's so profound. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved by the calling of the Holy Spirit. For if by one of the trespass, for by for if by the trespass of one Adam, his death reigned through one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of what? Who said it? Righteousness. Did you say it, Brother Fed? Righteousness reign in eternal life through the one Jesus Christ. Adam was a type of Christ, in that Adam had no sin. When he was created, Adam had no sin. Adam was also a prototype of all of mankind. Adam represented all of us as father of us. We would do what Adam did, which was we would have sinned like Adam did. One sin brought destruction on mankind. However, one ultimate sacrifice of Jesus has forgiven many trespasses to those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ Praise Messiah God Jesus. Amen. 
Let's continue in Romans 5.18. It says, So then, as through one trespass, Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation for all men. Even though, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted the what? The justification of life to all men. All men can be justified before God if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so through the obedience of one man, the Lord Jesus, the many will be made righteous and acceptable to God and brought into right standing with him. But the law came, and here's what the law was for, the law came to increase and expand the awareness of the trespass by defining and unmasking sin. But where sin increased, God's remarkable, gracious gift of grace, His unmerited favor, has surpassed it and increased all the more. God's grace is far greater than all of mankind's sin. So that as sin reigned in death, so also grace would reign through the righteousness which brings what? Eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we sang the song, you are flawless because of the, of the cross of Christ and your belief in it. So we are so blessed and fortunate that Jesus was obedient unto death for us through the grace of God, which is greater than any power of sin. That's a big wow, amen? Well, Romans 6.1 continues. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound even more? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? Yeah. His death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of our life in Christ. Amen? Since Jesus freed us from the sin, we should no longer be under the power of any sin. For we can have victory over it. We can have victory over any sin through, through the Lord Jesus Christ living in us through, by the power of the Holy Spirit. For we were spiritually baptized into Jesus' death and we were raised into the newness of life in Christ Jesus. As believers, we are no longer in Adam. We are now born again into the lineage of Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's what it means to be born again. To be removed from the lineage of Adam into the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that a hallelujah, church? Is that a hallelujah, internet family and friends? Praise God. So, as Roman, Romans 6, 5 Continues, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was what? Thank you. Crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. The atoning death of Christ Jesus has crucified our old nature with him on his cross. That was, that was once in Adam. Amen? Isn't that cool? This is why God's word tells us to deny ourselves, our old selves, our unrepentant selves, and to take up our cross and follow Jesus' life. Romans 6, 8 continues. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with Christ, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For, de for the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, this is where our part comes in. Likewise, you also, we also, Internet family friends, you also. Should reckon ourselves. 
Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Since we died with Christ, we shall also live with Christ. Since death and sin has no more dominion over Christ, it is also true death and sin has no more dominion over us either. Amen? Romans 6.12 goes on to say, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let, don't let sin overtake you and control you. You can have victory over it. That you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as what? Instruments. Thank you, Pastor Ray. Instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, we're under grace. Amen? Is that a hallelujah, church? What undeserved favor and blessing Christ Jesus gave us, how could we ever want to sin or offend our redeeming God? Since Christ Jesus sacrificed his life for us, it is our turn to present our entire bodies, minds, and souls as a living sacrifice to Yahweh God. Amen? Every day we should dedicate and present ourselves to God and ask Him, what do you want to do with me today, dear God? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy what? Sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable. This, get this part, this is truly the way to worship him. True worship to Yahweh God is through obedient sacrifice of ourselves to Yahweh God and his will, his way, and his plans. Amen? Romans 6, 15 goes on to say, Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does this mean we can go on sinning? Of course what? Of course not. Don't you realize that you became the slave of whatever you choose to obey? Whatever we obey, we become slaves to. If we have a love for money, we become obedient to greed. You can be a... You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Is that a hallelujah? Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teaching that we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin. We're free from it. And you have become slaves to righteous... Fill in the blank. Thank you, Brother Fred. Righteous living. You know what? Righteous living feels good. Whenever I get in my flesh, I can feel darkness and heaviness come over me. But then as soon as I confess it and say, Lord, take me out of my flesh. Let me, let me be back in your spirit, fully led by you. Then the love, the joy, the peace comes back immediately. In Romans 6.19, it goes on to say, Because of the weakness of your human nature, I'm using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. The more you sin, the more you want to go into sin more. That's why the leaders of our country and Many leaders across the world are going further and further into sin. They can't stop it because they don't believe. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become what? Holy. holy. Why? God says, be holy for I am holy. 1 Peter 1.16 and it's in the New Testament or the Old Testament too. Well, Romans 6.20 says this. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. We couldn't do right when, before we knew Christ. We couldn't do right. Everything we did was wrong. Even though it might seem right, it turned out wrong. 
And what was the result? You are now what? Ashamed of the things you used to do. I know I am. Things that end in eternal doom. But you know what? Jesus even paid the price for the shame and the guilt. He, he removed that too. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to what? Holiness. Holiness and result in eternal life. For here it is. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen? Now, I want to let us now relay a story in the Old Testament that exemplifies, exemplifies both freedom of sin and the opposite, being a slave to sin in the same event. Another way to say it is freedom from sin is trusting God and denying our flesh. Or are we trusting our flesh and being a slave to our faithful sin or, or being a slave to our sinful flesh unknowingly? Now, this is a story about Elijah. Elijah was a, was a prophet of God. Now, in 1 Kings, King Ahab was, was the king of Israel, and he had a wife named Jezebel. And Jezebel was, uh, was a uh, Phoenician priestess. She worshipped Baal and the gods of Asherah. Asherah. She turned Israel from believing in God, because she had great influence, to believing in these false gods. And uh, Ahab was looking for Elijah. But every time he went to go find Elijah, where they say he was, Elijah disappeared. But God called Elijah to do something, and so Elijah went to a man, Obadiah. Now, Obadiah was a servant of the king, King Ahab. So Elisha goes to Obadiah and says, uh, I, I want to see King Ahab. Obadiah says, oh, I don't want to do that because every time I, t I tell them that you're over here uh, and, you don't, you're, and you leave and he's not there and you're not there, he gets angry. I'm afraid he's going to kill me this time if I tell you that, that you're here and want to see him and then you don't show up. So Elijah says to him, as we pick up in 1 Kings 18, 15, but Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty, in whose presence I stand, I will present myself to Ahab this very day. So Obadiah went to tell Ahab that Elijah had come. And Ahab went out to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw him, he exclaimed, So is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? This is what Ahab said to Elijah. And Elijah returned, uh, replied, I have made no what? I have made no trouble for Israel. Elijah replied, You and your family are troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. So King Ahab is accusing Elijah of being a trouble of Israel because Elijah was faithful in warning Israel that Yahweh God is going to bring destruction upon Israel because of their unrepentant sin which sins which God's which included God's much hated worship of false gods by Israel. This is now listen brothers and sisters we, we fast forward to today. This is the same thing the world does to us Christians when we stand for truth today. They accuse us of being hateful to sexually immoral people when we warn them about Yahweh God's impending judgment on their sins. They say that we are the trouble, but we love and care for them and don't want them to end up in blackness of darkness forever. The evil world is accepting sin as normal, but God hates sin and will judge it all. As we continue in 1 Kings 18, 19, now here's what Elijah said. Now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who were supported by who? Jezebel. Thank you, Jeannie. 
So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood in front of them and said, How much longer will you waver, wavering between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. They didn't know what to say. I guess they were torn. They were wavering. So Elijah, by God's leading, challenged the Israelites to decide who they would follow. 1 Kings 18.25 Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first, for there are many of you. Choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call out on the name of your God. But do not set fire to the what? Wood. Thank you, Pastor Ray. The wood. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, O Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. They danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder. He scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming, or he's relieving himself, <laughs> or maybe he's on a way on a trip or is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they shouted louder. And following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until what? So the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. This is hours and hours. But still, there was no sound, no reply, no response. This is the same no response answer people will get today if they pray to false gods. Now, if they do get a response, it's probably from a demonic source. And here's the reason why. There is no response or there is a demonic re response because God's word says this. In 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men. There's only one. The man Christ Jesus. There is no other gods or prophets that you can go through to get your prayers to heaven. No, el no one else has the power or authority to take the prayers to the Father except the Lord Jesus Christ to get a response from heaven. 1 Kings 18.30 goes on to say, Then Elijah called to the people. He says, Come on over here. They all crowded around him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 what? Stones. One to represent each of the tribes of Israel. And he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. Then he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood on the altar, cut the bull into pieces, laid the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars of water and pour the water over the offering of the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they finished, he said, now do it a third time. Pour water over this. So they did it as he said. And the water ran around the altar and even filled the what? The trenches. Elijah was offering the wood and stones drenched in water so that it was not burnable by human fire. First Kings 18 goes on to say, At the usual time for the offering in the evening, now remember, this is all day, now it's Elijah's turn. Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar, and what did he do? He prayed. If anything comes before you, this is what you do. You pray. O oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh God, O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and you have brought them back to yourself. Elijah prayed one deep, heartfelt, short prayer. Not a matter how long you pray, it's how deep you pray. 1 Kings 18.38 says, Immediately 
fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, the dust, even licked up all the water in the trench. So then when the people saw it, they fell face down on the what? On the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Sisters and brothers, I recommend that we fall on our knees daily and cry out that the Lord God is our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 1 Kings 18.40 says, Then Elijah commanded, Seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people seized them all. And Elijah took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. Now, it is Mosaic law that false prophets were to be killed. Deuteronomy 18.20 says, But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Now, this part of the story exemplifies the believing faith of Elijah in Yahweh God. Elijah was trusting God and trusting in his commands by denying his flesh. So Elijah was in, the, was in the freedom from sin by serving Yahweh God. Now let's look at, at the rest of the story of Elijah. 1 Kings 19, 1. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the, the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me down and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. What gods is Jezebel talking about? Yahweh God and Elijah just proved there were no gods, that they were false. But here's what happened to Elijah. 1 Kings 19.3, Elijah was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He's running. He's running. From what? From nothing. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might what? Die. Thank you. I have I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who already have died. Then he lay down and slept under a broom tree. He was, he was depressed. He was discouraged. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head, some baked bread Bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. What happened to Elijah's faith? Why was Elijah running? God used Elijah to prove the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah were false and had no power. Didn't Yahweh God prove he has all power? What was Elijah doing? but becoming a slave to his fleshly sin by taking his eyes off the power of his mighty God. Amen? Here's the summary. Here's, here's our part. Don't we do the same thing Elijah did? Yes, we do. We see the power of God's mighty hands showing his miraculous works in our lives. Every one of you have stories about what God has done in your life. But then something threatens us and we panic like Elijah and we forget about who our mighty God is and his protection. We forget. I forget. I forget. A thought or an event comes into our minds and we become fixated on that thought and we let that thought and event control our minds just like Elijah did. He let the threat of Jezebel killing him by some false gods control him. That happened to me while I was preparing this message. I became overwhelmed with doing some of the financials and switching over from uh, uh, QuickBooks to uh, online QuickBooks and getting it lined up with the... I became overwhelmed. And then God said, Elijah, Norman, what are you, what are you doing? What are you getting worried about? 
Have I not carried you all the way through your life to now? That you're going to let this thing bother you and lose sleep over it? That's what happened. I said, okay, God, I can exhale now. I can breathe in, and I know that you will help me get through this. And I can not only survive it, but I can rejoice through it. We can rejoice through our trials and tribulations. Amen? So, here it is. May we keep our eyes on Jesus and stay in the freedom of righteousness and not become slaves to our fleshly thoughts and become slaves to sin. Let us not sabotage our faith and remain instead in the freedom of God's righteousness, freedom from sin through obedience to our God. This is how we sabotage our faith by taking our eyes off of Jesus. Come next, well, not next Sunday, but two Sundays from now, and hear what Yahweh God says to Elijah. Because next week, Brother Fred is going to do a concert for you. Jeannie and I are going to be out of town, but Fred's going to do a concert. So please, come and invite others to come and enjoy the, the gospel in music by Brother Fred and his band. What's the name of your band, Brother? Messenger. Messenger. Amen? So I'm going to put the word out to, to all those that, that weren't able to come today or didn't come today and let them know that there's a concert next week and for them to invite people too. So come and join uh, what God's going to do next week. Let's pray as we close. Father, thank you, dear God, for the message that you have brought to us, that we may know how great and powerful you are, and that we need not fear anything, but to walk in obedience with you, because we love you, and we praise you, and we know you are powerful. May we always remember that, because we pray this and ask this in the powerful name, the righteous name, the glorious name. We ask this for our internet family and friends, that they come to know the gracious power of you in their lives. And uh, again, we ask this in the powerful name, the righteous name, the glorious name, the holy name. Whose name, church? In Jesus. Whose name, church? Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And may his face shine upon you. Thank you for spending time with us today but remember please spend time in the presence of the Lord God being intimate with him praying reading his word and applying his word to your lives because in Jeremiah 9 23 and 24 thus says the Lord let not the wise man glory in his wisdom let not the mighty man glory in his might, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he knows and understands me, Yahweh God. Because he is the Lord, he exercises loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these he delights in, says the Lord. Let us adopt these principles daily in our lives that the Lord's grace may always be upon you and me. God bless you, and may you be completely enthralled in the love of God that he has for you.